Good morning and happy Wednesday. Uh, today we're going to be talking in a little bit more detail about the forces that charges experience when they're in magnetic fields. I wanted to start by revisiting the experiment that I showed you on Monday, but maybe do it less clumsily and in a bit more detail. So what we had um, was a beam of electrons being emitted here. So the electrons are going this way. That's the velocity vector to the right. And then what we did was we brought in a magnet. If you imagine my marker is the magnet, I brought it close to this beam of electrons so that the north end of the magnet was close to the uh, beam. The north end of the magnet means the field exits the magnet in the north and goes into the board. If it goes into the board, I can write my magnetic field as an X. So the magnetic field is going into the board. So what would you predict the um, force to be? How should these electrons curve in order to respond to this magnetic field? Well, if we take our naive guess that the force was proportional to the velocity crossed with the magnetic field, which is similar to what you found in your lab yesterday. Instead of velocity, you get a current, and you cross that with the magnetic field. Um, let's do that. Velocity is pointing this way. Magnetic field is pointing that way into the board. And so I expect the force to be up here. I expect the electrons to deflect up like that. But if you look closely at the video, what actually happens is the electrons get deflected down. So here's the expected from that equation, and uh, here is the actual. So what's happening? Did we get this um, order wrong? Well, if we switched the order, it would definitely change the sign of the force and have the force going down. But we're missing something. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. And so that provides us also with a negative sign. So apparently, the constant of proportionality here is the charge. That the force from a magnetic field, so I'll label that Fb, is the charge times the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field vectors. And this is the actual result here. This is called, uh, well, some people call it the Lorentz force. Technically, the Lorentz force is the electric and magnetic forces together. And um, so let's talk about that right now. This is what Thompson's experiment tells us or a version of Thompson's experiment, at least. We already know that um, forces experience, or I'm sorry, charges experience a force when they're in an electric field. The electric force, Fe, is the charge in question multiplied by the electric field. Well, evidently, forces or charges also experience a force when they're in a magnetic field with the form Fb is Q times V cross B. But only when they're moving, right? Uh, it depends on them actually having a velocity. So the total force F is the sum of these two. Fe plus Q um, V cross B. This is the Lorentz force. Lorentz. There's also a fellow named Lorentz, and they did uh, another thing together that's called the Lorentz Lorentz. Uh, I think that might be this actually, but it's, it's kind of confusing. Really, it's just called Lorentz with the C, without the T. So notice a few things. Notice one, the 
electric force is in the same direction up to a sign, right? This could be a negative charge, and in that case it's anti-parallel, but it's in the same direction up to a sign as the electric field. with the exception that you could have it going the other way if it was oppositely charged. And two, the electric force depends only on location. So if I wrote it more explicitly, I could say that uh, the electric force F sub E is a function of the position vector r because although q doesn't change necessarily with position, right? We're talking about a point charge here in this example. The electric field might change. So the electric force depends only on where you are. Three. The magnetic force is perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. And it is always perpendicular to the velocity and the magnetic field. If you notice in the example before, we had, if I do the right hand rule and you imagine it, we had the electrons deflected upward. So they deflect upward a little bit, but the force is still a perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. So it gets deflected again and deflected again, and that's why you have an arc, right? It looks like a centripetal force that always stays perpendicular to the direction of the velocity that's tangent to whatever the path is as it moves in a circle. Same thing here. Uh, this cross product guarantees that the force is always perpendicular to both of these vectors. Um, and four, that the magnetic force depends on both position and velocity. So I could write that the magnetic force F sub B is a function of the position vector and the velocity vector because you get the velocity vector here explicitly in the equation, and the magnetic field uh, might change with position. So the magnetic force depends both on where you are and how you're moving. Okay, let's see. A fifth thing you should notice, the magnetic force being perpendicular to the velocity vector means the magnetic force cannot change the speed. So the speed, right, is the magnitude of the vector. If it's perpendicular to be, it's always changing the direction but never the magnitude. Think about, again, uh, the centripetal force. The centripetal force, you could have an object moving at a constant velocity, or a constant speed around a circle, and you have a force always acting on it, and there's an acceleration towards the center, but since the acceleration is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity, it doesn't change the speed. The, the object doesn't start going faster. Not if it's a circular motion. So the speed does not change. What does this mean? Let's think about this in terms of the energy that the particle has. If we remember from energy, the work that the magnetic field does on the object, the electron for example, is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. So the change in the kinetic energy would be half times the electron's mass times the final velocity squared minus half 
the same mass times the initial velocity squared. But these are the same because I can't change the speed. And this only depends on the speed. So the work here has to be zero. This is because the final velocity is the set, or the final speed is the same as the initial speed. So what this means is that magnetic fields do no work. You cannot get work out of a magnetic field, which is curious. That's definitely different than electric fields because we can use electric fields to speed up and accelerate particles all the time. But magnetic fields, even though they can change direction and redirect the flow of uh, charge, they can't do any work on the system. Let's look at this from another perspective because we're calculus students here. So, recall that the work is the integral of the force over a path length, DL. So if I have my particle going this way along a path, this is, if this is DL here, and it has some velocity, this length, this infinitesimal length, would be the same as the particle's velocity times some infinitesimal time. So all I have here is that distance is velocity times time. So I can write this equation in terms of my, uh, magnetic fields as the integral of Q B cross B dot, and then DL is V DT. But look here, I have something that is perpendicular to V, and then I have here something that is parallel to V. So I have these two vectors, or these, yeah, these two vector quantities that are perpendicular to each other. So the dot product must be zero. And you could also use a uh, vector identity to expand this and see explicitly that you end up dotting um, V onto V, or onto a perpendicular vector to V, and so it has to be zero. magnetic and electrical fields. So, I can use the magnetic and electric fields together in order to direct particles. I have one, the electric field, that forces the charge to go in the same direction that I established the field in. And I have another, the magnetic field, that forces the particle to arc in a direction that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So let's say I establish a, I have like a, a capacitor plates here, or just some two uh, terminals of a circuit that I can change the electric field with, like, a, like the plates of a capacitor. And I put through it a constant, so here we have an example of combined putting a constant magnetic field in the space between these two plates. So this is B. It's going into the board. And I send through it an electron this way. So here I have my little charged electron that's cruising along, going to the right. This is the same as what we had before with the uh, Thompson's experiment. So which way is the electron going to be deflected? That's my first question. Which way? Is it going to go up or down? Let's use the right hand rule. B, B, F is this way, but it's negatively charged, so 
the magnetic force pushes the electron down. It gets deflected down. So now my question is, what should I do about the electric field in between these plates if I want to have the charge remain undeflected? So I want this charge to cruise through this plate, these plates where the magnetic field exists as if the magnetic field was not there. Which direction should I put the electric field? This way? What if I put what happens if I put the electric field this way? So let's do that. Let's put it this way. See what happens. If I put it this way, the electron when it's here, right? Which way does it go? Remember, it goes in the opposite direction of the electric field. So this is no good, because it's just going to go in the same direction as the magnetic field pushes it. I need the, um, here, we'll just cover that up. I actually need the electric field to go down. So here we have the electric field. So that the electric force goes in the opposite direction. So pay attention to the sign of the charges that you're dealing with when you're talking about uh, what the deflection is going to be due, due to a magnetic or an electric field. It's very important. All right, what's the second thing? What strength, or what's the relationship between the velocity of the electron that's moving along and the strength of the electric and magnetic fields? So I need, if this is going to be undeflected, I need these two forces to be equal, so that the force pushing down is the same as the force pushing up on the electron, all along here. And we can draw another electric field. I put it everywhere, uh, just for flavor. So I need the force, the electric force, to be the same as the magnetic force. So I have QE equals QB times E. I have just regular multiplication here because these, I'm just talking about the magnitude of the forces. We've already worked out the directions here in our previous discussion. So what I need really is that the magnitudes be equal because I've already set them up so that the directions will cancel out. And uh, the magnitude here is just the um, multiplication of V and B. So Q of it evidently cancels. And so the velocity of this um, electron is the strength of the electric field divided by the strength of the magnetic field. So I can use this kind of apparatus in order to measure the strength of the electric field. If I know what my, or I'm sorry, use this in order to measure the velocity of the electron if I know the strength of the electric field and the strength of the magnetic field. I can also do the same sort of thing in a different direction in order to measure what the magnetic field is. This is called, or what we're abusing here is called the Hall effect. So, this is what we use in order to measure magnetic fields. What we do is we have a strip of uh, a metallic strip that has a current running through it. So you have some electron that goes along with its strip velocity. And let's imagine that we had a magnetic field in this area that's going through the metallic strip. So um, I guess magnetic fields are green. There's a magnetic field here that permeates the strip going into the board. What happens to the electron? Well, I got V, B, F is to the right, but it's an electron, so it gets deflected to the left. So all of the electrons in this metal strip that are going along all get deflected over here to the left-hand side. So now I have a bunch of electrons over here. This side is more negative, but 
all of the lattice nuclei are still in this metallic strip, undisturbed. The lattice holds them in place. And so this side has to become positive because they're charged and go anywhere. The strip becomes polarized. The magnetic field is forcing all the electrons away so the depleted nuclei are more positive on the end. Well, what happens then? Remember, electric fields are red. If there is a uh, imbalance in charge here, there has to be an electric field that corresponds to it. All of these positive charges are producing an electric field that goes towards the negative charge, like this. And so now what happens to the electron? Well, the magnetic fields are pushing it this way, but it wants to go in the opposite direction of the electric field, and so it gets forced back the other way. What happens is that this is a self-reinforcing kind of situation where a electric field and a voltage gets established in the strip that exactly cancels the effect of the magnetic field so that the electrons and the current remain undeflected. This is the Hall effect. That a magnetic field through a current carrying strip produces an electric field that cancels the deflection of the electrons. And so here there is some voltage that is equal to the strength of the electric field divided by the width of the strip, D. And I know that there is some magnetic field that permeates the strip. And I know that they cancel um, each other out for the drift velocity. Uh, what do I want here? I measure the potential across the strip. So I measured V, which is the electric field divided by the distance. And I know the drift velocity, Vd. So this is the potential, the electric potential, and this is the drift velocity. Because the drift velocity is a property of the, uh, just to finish up, the idea of the Hall probe is the same as the idea of the canceling magnetic and the electric fields from before, where the electric field here has the drift velocity, or the magnetic field here has the drift velocity, and the electric field is the um, voltage that you measure times the distance between uh, the two sides of the strip. So the width of the strip, you measure, you have like a voltmeter here. So here we have a voltmeter that goes across the strip that measures the potential. And we know um, what the drift velocity is. Either that or we apply a known magnetic field and we measure what the drift velocity is. But the point is that you have an instrument that establishes a relationship between the magnetic field and quantities you can measure, right? I can just write uh, the drift velocity times the magnetic field is the voltage times the uh, width of the strip. And if you know three of these things, you can find what the other is. So in practice, usually what this uh, is used to do is to measure what the strength of the magnetic field is that's going through the strip. I wanted to show you a picture. I think I closed my browser, though. Let's try. All probe. If you look, what the Hall probe has are these little wands, and these are the metallic strips here, that you kind of rotate in, until you get the uh, magnetic field to be perpendicular to the metallic strip here. And you know it's perpendicular because it's the highest reading. If you have it parallel, then you're going to get no reading at all because there's no magnetic field uh, permeating the strip. 
So you have zero uh, voltage going across and zero reading on the Hall probe until you rotate it until the magnetic field is exactly perpendicular with the uh, plane of the strip here. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show you what it looks like. You attach this wand to a little box that gives you a reading. That does this. That does this calculation based on the voltage it measures in the known values of the drift velocity and the width of the strip that you're using. Okay, one more thing I wanted to talk about. I keep comparing the magnetic field to circular motion, and we saw that uh, electrons moving in a magnetic field move in an arc. And so let's do something more explicit with that, where we have, for example, um, electrons going through here. So here we have a beam of electrons, the velocity going this way. And in this region, we have a constant magnetic field. What happens? Well, I have here a magnetic force that pushes on my electron and makes it start to curve. And everywhere here, the magnetic force points towards the center. And so what happens is that the magnetic force provides the centripetal force that's required in order to move this electron in a curve. And so let's equate the magnetic force to the centripetal force. The question is, what radius does this circular arc have? Well, what can I do with the centripetal force? I think I'll set it equal to mv squared over r, since I know it's circular motion. And this over here is q times v times v. And now if I solve for the radius, I get that r is m over q, which is an interesting quantity. This is the mass of the electron divided by the electron's charge. And then I have to divide by v. So I get a v here, right? v squared divided by v. And I get a v. So I get m v divided by q v. This is called the spectrometer equation. Maybe some of you have used a spectrometer before. What it does is it measures the mass of the objects that you put through it. They don't have to be electrons. But how you set up a spectrometer is you have a chamber here. So you have an emitter. So what we're talking about here is a spectrometer. You have an emitter that puts the charged object, it doesn't have to be an electron, it just has to be charged, into this region where you have an electric field. The electric field accelerates the charges to a known value. And you can actually use crossed electric and magnetic fields in order to select a velocity here. So you have a velocity selector. Because only <clears throat> you can tune them so that only uh, charges of a specific velocity remain undeflected. And so enter the spectrometer chamber here. And then what you have is a detector that goes along here. And so I move the detector back and forth until I get a reading, until I uh, get a reading of charged particles hitting it. If I have the detector over here, well, these, these electrons in this case would curl and hit the wall, and I wouldn't get any reading, and then I'd move it until I got a reading. And then I can measure what the radius of the path is. So I can measure the radius 
I know what the charge is because I know what's being emitted here for my emitter. It might be on a, some medicine or something. And I know the velocity because I use my velocity selector. And I know the magnetic field because I established a known magnetic field here. And so I can measure the mass. That's the only thing that remains unknown. So sometimes these are called mass spectrometers. Technically, there are other kinds of spectrometers that operate on the, a similar principle. But this kind of mass spectrometer is used to measure the uh, mass of charged particles. But in general, we could also use this idea that the magnetic force provides the centripetal force in order to determine how these charges curl around uh, in a magnetic field. This is often used in particle accelerators as well because um, instead of just having a linear accelerator where you establish an electric field and the charges right along the electric field until they hit something over here, what we can do instead is have a curl tube and we put a magnetic field through here and then <clears throat> put an electric field that goes around. And so the particles are trapped in the circle and we can speed them up as much as we want before we collide them with something. So this is, this, these kind of linear accelerators are limited, but you can use magnetic fields in order to change the path of particles and get them going much faster. Um, the most simple example of this is called a cyclotron, but we don't really have time to talk about that right now. Uh, I just wanted to make you aware of these kind of problems and these kind of um, equipment, this kind of equipment.